So, Father God, right now, in the name of Jesus, we surrender to you. Father, we surrender everything. We put down our hopes, our plans, our dreams. We give you our days and our times. And, Father, we ask to be a people that are wholly separated, sanctified, and set apart from the ways of the world and set apart for you and to you. Father, we recognize that there are many ways where we still hold to our own ways and our own thoughts and our own, our own emotions can often lead us instead of your Holy Spirit. But Father, we desire to be like Jesus. We desire to live a life of wholehearted consecration to you, that we would live for your kingdom, for your glory, that it's only the name of Jesus Christ that would be exalted and it's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we would live. Father, we desire to be a holy people. There's no way we can achieve that in ourselves except desire it. But now we ask for your grace to bring it to pass. Sure. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So if you want to turn to Isaiah chapter 2. So we're still looking at the... Um, we're still looking at the tribes that uh, the, the Israelites had to defeat in order to possess the promised land. So God said, I've given you the land, but then they had to go in and they had to defeat them. So the first one that we looked at were the Canaanites, and um, they're the first ones that really show up with Abram. Um, and that was that was the business or the economy mountain and that was talking about the love of money we can see that in greed covetousness we can see it in materialism selfishness uh, and, and the main principality over that is the spirit of mammon uh, and in in to replace that we see god as our jehovah jireh he is the lord our provider so we don't need to toil and strain we don't have to you know chase our tail to make the money he is our provider and he is the one who gives us our daily bread. But it's, it's very much a, um, it's an area of easy compromise because, you know, even just going through the shopping center at Rabina, you can see the materialism, you can see the consumerism, you can see the greed, and we've got to have this and more and better and everything else. But it's, it comes back to the fact that everything we have has come from an almighty, loving, heavenly father who simply asked us to be a good steward. And as we steward it, we increase it, but we do it according to kingdom principles and not according to the ways of the world. So that was the first um, tribe that they had to overcome. The second one was the Hittites. And that word means fear, dread, terror. And that's the uh, media mountain. And that's really what has been fear has just been released through the media mountain with COVID. Fear is being released through the media mountain with recession and everything else that's going on. And the main principality over that is Apollyon the Destroyer. And uh, um, the opposite of that is the gospel, you know, the good news of Jesus Christ. You don't often hear much good news in these days, but it's the good news of Jesus. The power of the word in the beginning was the word. God is a communicator. And so the mountain of you know, um, communication and everything like that, the media mountain uh, is simply a perversion of the communications that come from the heart of God. And, and in that, with the fear and everything that comes, the, the, the way to overset that is really that people would know that God's got a good plan for their life. Jeremiah 29, 11, he's got good plans for your life, plans to give you a future and a hope and an expected outcome and uh, that you have a destiny. And in that, we also see the power of the blessing. When we start to bless people and bless situations and circumstances, um, that's, what, that's what we see. The one we looked at last week, or whenever it was, was the Hivites. And that is compromise. That's the arts and the entertainment mountain. And that's very much one of compromise. Uh, it's also one of seduction. Because it makes everything, you know, like, oh, I just, I just want to be like, the keeping up with the Kardashians and um, then you've got all the reality shows where everybody wants their 15 minutes of fame. You know, they want their name up there. Um, 
and uh, and really it's it's just such a perversion of uh, what God wants and so the the one of that is God is the creator and true creativity would come from God the creator not from the spirit of of seduction and compromise that comes through the arts and entertainment and the opposite of that is you know really John 10 10 Satan comes to steal to kill and to destroy but Jesus has come to give you an abundant life and that word Hivite actually um, the meaning of that word is like it's an um, it's a life-giving village, you know, like if you, it's like image is everything. That's really what it's like. Image is everything. Substance is nothing. And so um, that's what we looked at last time. The one we're looking at today is the Perizzites. And they first make their appearance in the word in Genesis chapter 15 as one of the tribes that Abram had to deal with. And this is the mountain of religion. This is what this one is, the mountain of religion. But I want to explain that the mountain of religion does not include Christianity. The mountain of religion is Buddhism, Muslims, uh, Hinduism, it's atheism, humanism, but it is not Christianity because religion means bondage. And in Isaiah chapter 2, um, It says in, the, in chapter 2, verse 2, it comes to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house, that's us, the mountain of the Lord's house, shall be firmly established as the highest of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So that the mountain of the Lord's house is firmly established above all of the others. So that's the covering over the seven mountains of, of culture, the seven mountains of society. It's the mountain of the of the the mountain of the Lord, and that's where we reside. We reside there. We do not have anything to do with the mountain of religion except to get those people saved. We do not have anything to do with religion, bondage, with works, with it. I should be doing this. It's my duty to do that. Nothing to do with that. The, the mountain of religion is all of the things that are not of Jesus Christ, even, um, you know, Mormonism and all of that kind of thing. It's just, that's the way it is. But the word parasite actually means it's an unwalled town or it's an unwalled village. It means that it's got, um, it's, it's an unprotected dwelling place. And the reason that people run to religion is because they feel that they need protection. So you go to India where there are hundreds of gods. You know, we've got, um, you've got this, this all, and every God is designed to do something for them or be something for them. Um, but it's, it doesn't bring life. Religion only brings death and it brings bondage. It, does, it has never, ever released life in any way, shape or form. And so but that's what it means. Parasite means an unwalled town. It's an unwalled village. It's unprotected dwelling place. So in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 5, it talks about the, the, the promised land and, and where they were going. And it says that um, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 5 says, All these cities were fortified with high and haughty walls, gates, and, and bars, besides a great many unwalled villages. So these were villages that were completely devoid of protection. The enemy could come in from any side and attack. And that's one of the things that happens when you're in religion. You know, it's just life is hard. You can't seem to get ahead. You can't seem to stop the sin cycle. All of those things seem to happen. And so this is the enemy can enter at any time and in any way. And in Proverbs 25, 28, this is something for us to ponder. It says, he who has no rule over his own spirit <clears throat> is like a city that is broken down and without walls. 
So we've really got to allow our own spirit to rule us. So quite often, particularly in Western countries, so I travel a lot through the South Pacific and I, I deal, and honestly, they talk to me in, in South Pacific language, like Tongan, and Fiji and Samo and Māori. And they look at me like I'm expected to understand. I haven't got a clue. But God has knit our hearts together in such a way that quite often they, they will just fall back. They feel so comfortable. They fall back into their own language. And I'm kind of like, oh, God, I need discernment here. I have no idea what, what even what language this is, let alone what they're saying. But um, so it's, it's recognizing that people need to be safe. People need to feel protected. It's one of our basics. And, um, and if we don't have any rule over our own spirit, then we are like an unprotected, unruled, um, broken down city that has no protection whatsoever. So with the South Pacific, what I find with them is that it, that it is so easy for them to flow in the spirit, right? It's just easy because to them, the spirit realm is so real. Whereas for, for us, we've been educated, Western education and intellect and analyzing and it's got to be logical and I've got to understand it. They don't need to understand it. And they take great pride in their culture because they say they are people of faith because only people of faith would get in canoes and leave one land to find another. You know, it takes faith to do that. And so they, they flow so easily in the spirit that sometimes I feel like a raw beginner and, uh, and yet we, we rationalize, it's got to make sense, it's got to be, you know, I've got to understand what's going on, all of these things. And, and so we, we don't allow our spirit to rule. Our soul rules. And when that happens, we are out of order. And we're not flowing with the Holy Spirit, we're flowing with ourselves. And depending on how much our mind has been renewed, part of it might be, you know, God's way. And then there's a mix of Suzette. And then there's a mix of something I've heard from someone else. So it's recognizing that truly we have got to come to the place, the Western church, where we flow in the spirit of God, where the Holy Spirit, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit is more real to us than the person sitting next to you, than the person in the Zoom, you know, meeting. It's, it's more real. And we've got to learn to live out of our spirit rather than out of, because quite often our soul responds to circumstances and situations. We respond to what is happening, but the soul does not respond to that. Our spirit does not respond to that. The spirit, when it's born again, responds to the Holy Spirit. And so it's one of the things that I cry out to God for Australia as one of the lands of the, one of the South lands of the Holy Spirit in being titled and named after the Holy Spirit, it's quite possible that the only way that our nation is going to be transformed is by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. So, you know, it's like Holy Spirit, come, possess your land. Holy Spirit, come, possess your people. Um, it's that, that kind of a thing. So we've got to make sure that unwalled is not us because we've got to allow the Holy Spirit to be our, our everything and, and learn to live through the Spirit, by the Spirit, um, for the glory of God and for the good of ourselves, if that kind of makes sense. One of the, the Elise, I noticed that you asked a question. Let me just see if I can find that. When you live out of your spirit, quite often it does not make a lot of sense. Um, it just, you know, like there's just... I'm saving up for a car or whatever it might be. And then God tells you to give everything that you've got in the bank account to somebody else. And you think, yeah, but God, I'm saving up for a car. Or I've got bills coming up. But he says, get rid of it. So the soul says, that's a ridiculous thing. Get behind me, Satan. Or I don't understand why God would ask that or anything. But the spirit says, if that's what you want, Father, I'm happy to do it. Even if you're not sure what's going to come out of it, how it's going to affect anything. But it's that loving obedience to an instruction um, when you live in the spirit, there's a sense of underlying joy and peace, even when you're walking through stuff that's hard. But when you're walking through stuff that's hard and you're living out of your soul, it's hard going. 
because you're constantly trying to second guess. You're tr constantly trying to think, well, maybe I should do this or maybe God's doing that. You're constantly second guessing and you've stepped away from the wisdom of God. So does that kind of answer your question? Okay. So um, I don't quite know how to get chat down there, but that's okay. So, um, yeah, so it's recognizing that your spirit. So that, that prayer that I often talk about that we learned from Beth Nixon, like about seven years ago, where we call our spirit to the top of our being. So spirit, I call you to the top of my being to be in submission to the Holy Spirit. And my soul, I command you to be in submission to my spirit and flesh. I command you to be in submission to my soul, to be in kingdom order in Jesus name. And so you just, you just switch and it's living by the spirit that is the key for everything else because the soul is, is tainted. Part of it's renewed. Part of it is in the process of being renewed and part of it is still unbroken ground. It's still, it's a hard path, you know, so it's recognizing these things. So in the, but so with an unwall, one of the things that unwalls us is that when we no longer really believe the word of God, when our faith is taken a battering, and you know that often happens sometimes with unanswered prayers, um, things that haven't quite worked out the way they thought that they would, then things tend to affect us, and that's an area where some of our defense, our protection comes down, and we start to be part of that unwalled. Uh, area so it's recognizing what it is but it's recognizing please that you are in the mountain of the lord that is raised above the seven mountains of culture you are not living in the same level as the people in the seven levels of culture you are supernatural beings you are new creations in christ you are ambassadors for jesus christ you are the temple of the holy spirit you're seated in heavenly places with christ and so you come out of that mountain of the lord which is superimposed over the seven other mountains and you infiltrate them, you bring salvation, you bring redemption, you bring transformation, and then you come back up to the, to the mountain of the Lord to get the next lot of instructions. So you can go back down into your mountain and bring transformation, reformation, salvation, redemption, back up to the mountain of the Lord. So your, the, your home base is the mountain of the Lord. And when you are sent out on assignment, you go and infiltrate those mountains and take in what God wants you to take in, transform what he wants you to transform bring reformation restoration whatever it is and then you go back to the mountain of the lord for the next set of instructions does that make sense one of the biggest dangers we can do is to think that we actually live in one of those seven mountains i might be an australian citizen i have an australian passport but my first loyalty is to the kingdom of god that's my first loyalty because before anything else, I'm a citizen of heaven. So I have dual citizenship. I'm a citizen of heaven. I'm a citizen of Australia. But when push comes to shove, it will always be God first. That is my home. That is my home. So I'm here on assignment. And when it's time to go back, I go back home, but that's my home. And I am just here on assignment. I'm like a pilgrim. You know, we've got to take that, that attitude of Abraham, we're just passing through. We're on assignment for God. We're going to do what he's called us to do, fulfill our destiny, his assignment, stand before him at the end of our days. He's going to say, oh, you are awesome kid. I love you so much, you know, and, and we go back home to heaven. It's, but we've, we've got to stop thinking that we're um, Australian first. Your kingdom citizen first. You're a son and a daughter of the Most High. You're, you're clothed in robes of righteousness. You're seated in heavenly places with Jesus. The devil is under your feet. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the light of the world. So when you enter a situation or a circumstance, you release the light into that dark thing. You are the salt of the earth. You bring preservation. You bring flavor. You bring those things that only Jesus Christ can bring because you are the carrier of his glory. And so this is, this is who you are. So when you enter into these things, that's, that's, that's who you are. You know, so we've got to stop living as a human being and recognize that first and foremost, you are a spiritual being having a, a human experience. A lot of people teach that you're a human being having a spiritual experience, but that's not true. First and foremost, you are spiritual because even right now while we're sitting together in our lounge rooms or wherever talking to each other via Zoom or listening while I talk, 
um, and I can talk underwater, so I apologize. But even while we're, we're here in the natural and we can see each other, the reality is that you are right now seated with Christ in heavenly places. How amazing is that? That's the reality. We are bilocational people. And, and the reality is that that's where we are. So as we learn to live from that place of ascension in the spirit realm and look down th through the perspective of God and, and everything, you will never be unprotected. You will never be like an unwalled village or an unwalled town because you are in that high place. You're in that secret place with God. And, uh, and so there's that protection. And so the people in the mountains of religion, they have all of these... Um, religious idols for want of a better word all of the gods that they serve simply because of fear because they want protection they want someone to assure that they can be provided for they they need what you know that every one of us was born with a a void in our heart that only a god could fill only the god could fill so we're all looking for the supernatural we're all looking for that but we found it in jesus christ and so um, it's recognizing that religion is the, one of the biggest enemies that you can have in your life. And if ever you find yourself saying things like, well, I should be doing that, or I should be saying that, or I should be living this way, that is usually religion. Religion brings condemnation. Religion brings shame. Religion brings guilt. Uh, religion and it's taken back to the original meaning of the word actually means bondage and uh, you know I don't I want a life of freedom I don't want with what that's got so it's recognizing that um, freedom if you are not free then what is the truth that will need to be set you free because we, we were born to be free in Christ so the um, one one years ago when I was working at a church and you know every Sunday you've got your job and you turn up to go to you're either on ushering or you're on hospitality or you're greeting new people well guess where I was I was in the bookshop hey <laughs> yeah so I'm serving in the bookshop and um we were just I was talking to a pastor before the beginning of the service just before we opened the doors so I had to get to the bookshop and I said to him I guess I'd get, better be going and do my duty I'm on bookshop today and he said, if it's a duty, I don't want you to do it. Because if it's duty, it's religion. And I was like, whoa, you know, do I? So that really changed everything. Is it a duty? My oh, goodness, I don't want it. You know, so we recognize that we kind of want to be dutiful to God, but it's a joyful, loving obedience, not a sense of duty, not a sense of I have to do this, but I want to do this. That's the big difference between religion and relationship. So the, the major principality to my way of thinking over the mountain of religion is Lucifer. Because religion, the key thing, the key component in all religions is worship. And he was the, um, the leader of the worship in heaven before he, iniquity was found in him and pride and he, and he took a fall. So it's that false worship and lucifer was a worshiper and so in churches and things quite often when there's trouble with the worship team we think oh it's jezebel everything gets blamed on jezebel honestly she is the most active spirit boy but it's not always jezebel to my way of understanding if there is challenge in a worship team if things aren't working right with the worship then it is a luciferian spirit that is coming against it because that's what he was in charge of. And so it's recognizing these things as we walk in, in the fullness of it, because um, the demonic strategy is to steal worship and glory from God. That's what they want to do. They want to steal the worship and the glory that belongs to God. And so that's why it's so important that we live out of a loving relationship of joy and peace and life and everything else that, that Christ gives us to show the difference between relationship and religion. Um, and, and, it's, you know, and, and you often find too that religion, and, and I'm guilty of this, I say I talk about God, but in reality when the disciples came to Jesus and they said, will you teach us to pray, which is a 
um, a religious type of activity for, you know, religious type of activity. He didn't say God. He said our father. And so religion will take away from that father child relationship. And you'll often find people with, in, with a religious spirit who have an orphan spirit. They have no understanding of what a father child relationship is of, of how much a father loves his child of how much a father gives for his child. Uh, and so there is that orphan kind of a spirit thing that attaches them, itself to them. Has anybody got any questions or anything? You're allowed to unmute and ask a question or say something. Nothing. The invitation will stand. So the strategy of the religious mountain is it stops restoration and it stops redemption and it stops salvation because religion will not get you to heaven. Only Jesus Christ can do that. So religion can offer eternal life, but it will not give it to you. Religion will offer a good life if you obey all the rules and all the rituals and do all the things, but it's not a good life. And, uh, and it cannot reform or redeem or restore anything except captivity. And we have become, I don't know what the word is, we have become Almost, it's, the word's not immune, I can't think of it, but we don't recognize religion when it's in our lives. We are so quick to see it in other people. But when it comes to ourselves uh, and areas where we might have an orphan spirit, areas where we're relying more upon the soul, areas where we're relying more upon this is how many hours I, I spend in prayer, this is what I do for God, um, they're, they're pointers towards the religious spirit. And so it's recognizing God, if there's any, any aspect of religion in me whatsoever, I don't care what you've got to do, rip it out of my life, rip it out of my mind, rip it out of my heart, rip it, just rip it out, get all the roots, everything, and just get all of religion out of me in the name of Jesus Christ, just do it. And if I kick and scream because you're, you know, you're barbecuing some sacred cows, if I carry on like a pork chop or whatever it might be, just go ahead and do it anyway, because I want to be so free in the Holy Ghost. I want to be so free in that father-child relationship. I want to be so free to love you and worship you and glorify you and enjoy you forever. And I do not want anything to minimize my relationship with you. Compromise will do that. You know, when you, um, there are times when I watch too much TV. I'm tired. I just want to veg. I'll turn on the TV and I'll sleep. I could easily go and put on a cassette, a cassette, there goes my age, put on a CD and, and listen to worship music and veg that way. But, my, but I go the opposite way. There's nothing wrong with watching TV, but when it becomes a habit, then it is wrong. But it's, it's, it's just sort of saying, Holy Spirit, I cannot. I cannot clean up my own life. I need you to do it. I need you to do it. You know, so I was talking to somebody today. I had to do a Zoom, a couple of Zoom calls and... Um, and they were sort of talking about other people. And I said, you know, it's none of your business where they're at or what they're doing. You have the privilege to pray for them, but you do not have the, the right to speak about them. I said, it's the Holy Spirit who cleans the fish. We catch it, but the Holy Spirit cleans it. So all you can do is love them, pray for them, bless them, affirm them. But, you know, and, and correct them when the Holy Spirit gives you the license to do so. But to judge and to condemn is the work of religion. So when I said, yes, the Holy Spirit's job to clean the fish, he said, can he gut it too? And I thought, he's not listening. You know, is the Holy Spirit going to gut the fish as well. And I'm thinking, oh, Lord. But, you know, we all have areas where we are unprotected 
because we have stepped into a place of religion or a place of duty or a place of responsibility without the life-giving Holy Spirit. And so, you know, just allow the Holy Spirit to do an audit every now and again, although I sound a Scientologist, do an audit. But Holy Spirit, you know, if there is anything in me, I just want, to, I just want your conviction and then I will surrender it to you and ask you to clean it out of my life in the fullest possible way. Because all I want, I just love God so much. I just want to please him. The thing is, he's already pleased. He's already pleased. It's not about what I do or how I live. He loves me. Get up. Suzette, I think the, the, the biggest thing we can take from this is that Every religion has us reaching God by our works and by our self-promotion, by something we do. If we constantly recognize that everything we have is a gift from God, yeah. the grace is a gift from God, salvation is a gift from God, our, even our faith is a gift from God, our, our daily breath is a gift from God, my sight, my life, my, my partner, husband, wife, my children, they're all a gift from God. That will keep us from that religious mountain if we just yeah. constantly remain uh, grateful, humble enough yeah. to realize that everything we have is from Him. Yes, grateful and humble to realize that everything we have is from Him. And when you when you do that, it's so much easier not to find yourself in religious works in an area of your life exactly right and it's recognizing that god and his grace reaches down because if you look at the tower of babel they were reaching up so religion reaches up like Hedda said but god reaches down how amazing is his love and so it's it's um also recognizing that what religion does is it perverts the goodness of god it just perverts his goodness and it blocks it actually blocks eternal salvation. Because without Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. So the Lord is our Redeemer. Yeah, I love that um, verse in Psalm 103, verse 2. I, let, the Redeemer, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, for he has redeemed them from the hand of the adversary. I love that. And... Um, Oh, what was her name? Dr. Lillian Yeomans, when she opened a hospice for people that were dying, that was the script that she gave them um, for healing. And because uh, she was a doctor, she opened this hospice and people who were on the last stages of life went there to be healed. So she only had terminal, <laughs> life is terminal anyway, but she only had the really sick and, and right on the edge of death people come. And she would hand, she said, this is your prescription. And what it says is that um, Jesus has redeemed me from the curse of the law, tuberculosis, leukemia, whatever it might be, is under the curse of the law. I have been redeemed from leukemia, tuberculosis, whatever it was. And she said, that's your prescription. You say it as often as, as you as it comes to mind and they had to carry it in their pocket or their purse or whatever and just by that simple thing by saying it by um meditating upon it faith came when faith came it broke the bonds of sickness and disease and i, th I think it was about 90 something percent of people were healed in her hospice just incredible just the power of the word of god you have been redeemed so whatever area of life you are fighting, you start speaking over that area. I have been redeemed. I've been redeemed from toxic relationships. I've been redeemed from um, poverty. I've been redeemed from sickness and disease. I've been redeemed from confusion. I've been redeemed from a lack of guidance, a lack of clarity. I have been redeemed, total redemption. I've been given a good life and I am redeemed. In the name of Jesus, he has redeemed me. Jesus paid the full price and I have been taken out of the kingdom of darkness. I've been taken out of the hand of the enemy and I have been placed in the kingdom of God. I am redeemed. And, um, and that's just such a powerful key when you know it. So quite often I'll walk into situations and it's not looking good. But what I say is I've been redeemed from this situation. 
I've been redeemed from, from fallout. I've been redeemed. Jesus Christ has paid the price to get me out of the hand of the adversary. I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. This is under the curse. I've been redeemed from this. And so the reality of that, when it hits your heart and when it hits your, your, um, hits your soul with, with just like a revelation, everything changes. And it's, um, but it's recognizing, please recognize that religion will block salvation. It will literally block it because all the people, and this is the incredibly sad part, all the people in the mountain of religion are doomed to eternal death unless they come to know Jesus Christ for themselves. And that's, that's a really sobering thought. And um, because Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. But this is eternal life. Turn to John chapter 17. This is eternal life. It's not just heaven. It's not about heaven. This is eternal life. It is um, to know him, to know God, the only true and real God, and to know Jesus the Christ, whom you have sent to earth by finishing the work you gave him to do. But this is eternal life, that you would know God and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's eternal life. Heaven is the destination, but eternal life is your relationship. And you got that the minute you got born again. In John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, we, we often talk about um, verse 16, but verse 17 is just so important. It says, so, For God so greatly loved the world that he gave up his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And what is eternal life? That we would know God, know God and Jesus Christ. But verse 17, God did not send the Son into the world in order to judge the world, but that the world might find salvation and be made safe and sound through him. So Jesus wants to bring safety and soundness to every single person on the planet. You know, that's, that's the will of God. It's not that um, he doesn't want to judge the world. He doesn't want to condemn the world. He doesn't want to pass sentence on the world, but he wants the world to find salvation, to find redemption, to be made safe and sound through Jesus Christ. So that is eternal life. And this is why God um, so greatly loves. And, and I think, you know, with, with everything that's going on and, oh my gosh, I have got a client in America uh, who wants to leave America. And he's trying to get out. But of course, you know, travel isn't really good at the moment with COVID. Um, but he, was, he said, whoever wins the election, America is going to end up in a civil war. That's what he's saying. And I, I had actually had the temerity to um, send off his prayer email and put on the bottom of it, God bless America. So he wrote back and he said, yeah, why would God bless America? you know, and all the abortions and the this and the this and the this and the this. And I wrote back and I said, but the heart of the father is to bless, you know, and, and Jesus has paid the price. And I said, and I bless America because you've sent out missionaries, because you've stood with Israel, because after the second world war, you helped to redeem and restore the countries that were defeated. Um, I, I bless America because the president Trump, he's overturning legislation. He's done more to stop human trafficking than any other president in the United States. I bless America because there's still good stuff happening there. There's still good things happening. I bless America. Uh, anyway, so there's been these emails <laughs> like backwards and forwards because there is no way, apparently, according to this man, I should have blessed America. Dear God. So anyway, but you know, but that's the heart of the Father. You know, like there's, there's areas in everyone's life where he's, where he's not really probably very thrilled, but he loves you. And he, he loves, I, I, I said to somebody today, you know, but Jesus loves messes. He loves to walk into the mess of a person's life and clean it up. He loves to do that. You know, he loves to bring um, wholeness and, 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 and order into a person's life. He loves to fix the impossible and make it possible. He loves to do that because he loves you. 
And so it's, it's yeah, but um, yeah, so be careful who you say God bless America to. <laughs> Anyway, I'm not, I am not answering any more of his emails because I really put a can on the pigeons. <laughs> but it's recognizing that it is about, not about behavior, it's about relationship. It's not about what you do, it's about who you are and how you live. And, um, and it's about uh, honoring God. I think that's one of the things that is so important in the mountain of the Lord, in the house of the Lord, is honoring him. And I think that's one thing that we have lost to a certain extent, and that's why there is no fear of God in our communities. Because if it's not in the church, it's not going to be in the community. And the early church, and I think it was Acts, uh, let me just find it, it was Acts 11 or 13, I think. Oh, probably can't find it. I'll need to find it. But it says that, at least you're good at finding things while I talk. Uh, he said they walked in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. So the early church, that's how they walked and said there was peace on all sides. They walked in the fear of God in that awesome respect, that honor, that reverence. Um, and so it's recognizing when the anointing comes that you respect and steward the anointing. But sometimes I find that, that people can cut right across the anointing when God is in the middle of doing something or wanting to release healing people or say something or do something and it cuts across the anointing and, um, and the anointing just, and it's really hard to get it back. Um, and, and I noticed a, a couple of weeks ago, the anointing was so strong. So it's Acts 9.31. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you, Shane. The churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. They were multiplied. And, and I often pray that for open heaven, that we would be a people who walk in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Bring on the multiplication, Lord. You know, but, but it's the... Um, yeah, so a couple of weeks ago, I'm preaching and, there, and, and the anointing was there and it was strong and, and it was flowing. Then all of a sudden, the anointing's gone and it's like plowing through thigh-high mud, you know, and you're, you're trying to figure out what's happened. Did I say something wrong? So you, you're still talking to the people, but on the inside, there's this conversation with, with the Father. Like, Father, did I say something? Did I do something? What, what happened? Where's your presence? How did we offend the Holy Spirit? Because it's easy to grieve and quench the Holy Spirit. So what, what have we done, Holy Spirit? And then my, my attention was directed and there was somebody browsing at the book table not paying attention to the word of God, not attention to me, but attention to the word of God. And they were browsing at the book table and that was what broke the anointing. And so it's recognizing that these things are really important. We need to know how to steward the anointing. We need to recognize uh, when, when God is moving in a, a conversation, you can look at people and you think, oh, I, I really wanna go and talk to that person. And you think, oh no, wait a minute you sense that there is an anointing happening on the conversation. And if you go up and join it, then you'll, you'll just cut across that anointing and what God is doing is stopped. So we've got to become more spiritually sensitive and more aware of what the Holy Spirit is doing and how he does it. Because it's easy to, not easy, but he is grieved and he does get quenched. And um, we want, I, I just want the Holy Spirit to do whatever he wants. But I also want the Holy Spirit to shut down whatever needs to be shut down. So um, it's recognizing that the anointing is incredibly important. Then honor we, and honoring each other. Not comparing ourselves with one another, but honoring each other. Honoring your, the other's relationship with God. Honoring that they might hear from God differently. Honoring that they might be at a different place. But honoring them as a... a child of God and um, that's why I think that, that a Christian marriage is so absolutely amazing because God has entrusted one child 
to, to you know, he's, he's entrusted somebody to you in a marriage relationship. It's an incredibly gracious, powerful thing. Um, and yet, so it's just waffling, but honor, bring it back to honor, honor each other, honor God and, and give people space and grace for the Holy Spirit to convict them of where they're at rather than confronting them and saying, hey, you're wrong and this has got to change. Give the Holy Spirit some grace and space to do what he can do and he can do best and he can do it eternally. One of the other things too is in the, the mountain of religion, it doesn't matter how hard you try, you're never good enough. You're never good enough. Never be good enough to do this. Your prayers aren't as good as someone else. You just don't get a revelation of the word like they do. It's just this, this, you're never good enough. But the beautiful thing is, in the mountain of the Lord, he has put his value upon you. He has decreed that you are worthy. Doesn't matter what we think about ourselves, but God has declared that you are worthy. You are his. You belong to him. You're seated with him in heavenly places. You know, you have a father-child relationship. You are his. He has placed his value and his worth upon you. And this is um, so important. So it's when we come against the parasite spirit, you have got to stay in the opposite spirit. Anytime you confront a spirit of the enemy, whether it's a spirit of greed, then you've got to stay in generosity. The spirit of hate, you've got to stay in the spirit of love. You have got to find the opposite spirit. So when you're being confronted by a, a demonic spirit, you have got to be the, the opposite spirit. And that's the whole key. This is why I'm sort of laboring a little bit between the religion and the, the, the righteousness of God, because you've got to stay in that opposite spirit. So it's not about working hard. It's not about being good. It's not about what you think of yourself or what you think of anyone else, but the whole thing is God has put his value on you and he has deemed you worthy to, for the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He has deemed you worthy. And there is no condemnation. There is only conviction. So a conviction leads to life. A conviction is, oh gosh, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm happy to change. A condemnation is, oh, Oh, when we beat ourselves up and we, you know, mea culpa, mea culpa, we do the whole thing. But the condemnation is straight from the pit of hell. It releases shame and guilt. Uh, it makes it very hard to stand back up again. It makes it hard to run to God. Whereas the conviction of the Holy Spirit means that when I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit, it's easy to run to God. You know, like because the Holy Spirit's convicted me, it's the goodness of God that leads to repentance. So it's a, it's easier to run to God than run away from him. And that's what we find in the life of King David when he did wrong, apart from the fact when he tried to cover up Uriah's death and Bathsheba and then the prophet confronted him. But up until that time, anytime he did anything wrong, he ran to God. You know, he knew that that was their way to go. But quite often when we do something wrong or when we've sinned or when we've got unforgiveness or when we feel condemned or whatever, we, we sort of distance ourselves. And that's the very opposite of what God is wanting and God is requiring of us. So it's, it's honor, it's love, it's, um, it's loving extravagantly loving extravagantly and and a pouring out and the beautiful thing is that it's the love of God that has been poured into your heart by the Holy Spirit your heart is full of the love of God and so it's releasing God's love into other people so I have a friend just about 30 years ago she was in a, a violent uh, marriage relationship and um, quite often beaten and beaten severely and uh, uh, the Lord said to her, I want you to love your husband, love him with the love of God. So it came and he was, he started beating her again. And all she could say was, I love you with the love of God. And when she said that, um, she didn't feel any pain from any of the punches or the kicks or anything. She didn't feel anything. So she woke up in hospital, but there was no pain. She didn't have any trauma. God completely protected her 
from the, like she was still beaten, but there was no pain, there was nothing, because her, the love of God was her defense and her protection. She was not like an unwalled city or an unwalled village like the Perizzites talk about. She was actually protected by the love of God. She had obeyed the commandment to love God and to love people as you love yourself. She actually lived that, and that was what actually, I think, protected her from dying. And, um, and it was just, she said it was amazing. She would talk about it later. And when she talked about it, her face would light up and she would glow because all she could say was, I didn't feel anything except God's love. So in the midst of the beating, she felt nothing but the love of God. I mean, it's an incredibly supernatural thing. It's just amazing. Um, but God had told her, I want you to love your husband with the love of God. And, uh, and so she's, you know, she healed really quickly. She's great. She's, I think she's remarried to another guy now, but just life just, and she still to this day knows how to love and love well. You know, she knows how to love well. So one of the other things too is grace. And we were blessed with Cole Stringer on Sunday night when he preached about grace. And we are having difficulties, aren't we, Denny, still difficulties with Cole Stringer? She's been working since Sunday night trying to get it up on YouTube, but it doesn't matter which way we've tried it. We're just struggling for it to work. Um, he talked a lot about the grace of God. And, and that's just so important because in religion, you think you can, you can do it in your own strength. But in righteousness, it's the grace of God that empowers you. It's the empowerment of God to do what he's called you to do. It's the, it's the grace. It actually says in Romans chapter 5. Let me turn there. In verse 1, it says, Therefore, since we are justified through faith, let us um, grasp the fact that we have uh, peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And through him, we have our access by faith into this grace in which we firmly stand. We stand in the grace of God. That is my foundation. That is where my foot, that is my, that is my floor. I stand in the grace of God. I stand in that grace of God. And it empowers me to do what God's called me to do. And then I think it's in Titus so either chapter two or chapter three, it says that the grace of God instructs me on how to live a godly life. The grace of God is my teacher because, you know, in the, if you look at Matthew chapter five, the Old Testament, um, you know, where it says, but truly I tell you, in the olden days you were told this, but now I tell you, Jesus is saying, in the old days you didn't sleep with a, you didn't commit adultery. And now Jesus is saying, but now in this new covenant, you can't even look at anyone with the wrong kind of a, an idea, with the wrong kind of concept. It's, it's, you've got to have a pure mind. In the Old Testament, it was about pure deeds, you know, living righteously. But in the New Testament, you, you can't even think in the wrong way, you know, because if you think adultery, then you might as well have committed it kind of thing. And there's no way we can think like that except by the empowerment of the grace of God. It's only by the grace of God that we can live a righteous life at the standard of Jesus Christ, which is what we're called to. The Old Testament, it was at the standard of a human being who was in covenant with God, but it was through sacrifices that had to be re-sacrificed, you know, bulls and goats and turtle doves and everything else. But the New Testament is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. It's the power of his life that was shed, poured out for us and, and his blood that was shed for us. And, but he's called us to live as Christ lives because we're seated with Christ. So we're called to live at a particular level where um, we can't even look at anyone in the wrong way with the wrong kind of mindset. You can't do that in our own strength. We can't do that. Um, any of the things in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 5 there that's requested of us, we can't do that in our own strength. We just, it's impossible but by the grace of God, by the empowerment of the grace of God, we can, because the grace of God will do the work. The grace of God is our instructor. The grace of God does such a work of sanctification and peace in us that um, it causes us to live in a different way. So it's recognizing that this mountain of religion is one of pure hatred and evil. It is bondage. 
it, it stops salvation, redemption, restoration. There is really, and if there is any good works, it is done by the power of the flesh. So it's not accepted in, in the sight of God in any way. Um, the thing is, love is the only thing that penetrates religion. Love is the only thing. So for a lot of Muslims, they have, they, they've got a very strict God. You know, Allah, very strict. So they don't know the love of a father. So when we evangelize, when we go into this mountain of religion, when we are faced with Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists, humanists, um, shamanists, all the other ists that are out there, what the one thing, the one thing that cracks the, the, the uh, protection that they have over is love. It's the love of God. It's the words that are drenched with the anointing of Christ that, that cuts the heart, that, that opens them up to the love of God. You know, it, it's, love is, is, um, cannot fail. Love simply cannot fail. And, and I think Jesus said, you know, that the world will know that you are my disciples because you have love one for another. This love is... is it's going to be so important in the times that are coming. So important. And I really don't know if we understand what that looks like or how we live it or even what it means apart from when we say, you know, I love you. But, but love is sacrificial. Love is actually bringing out the best in the other person. Love is making a decision that you want nothing but the highest and the best for that person. Love is laying down your life so that they can have what is for them. You know what I mean? Love is just so important. And praise God for Jesus who laid down his life for each and every one of us. But he is an example of love. Paul, you know, like he poured out, you know, I travail until Christ is formed in you. You don't travail in prayer unless you are motivated by love. You know, you can, you can, say prayers but when you when you travail when you're pouring out your very heart and soul that that's love and it was um praying hide i think it was praying hide i think it was him i'm not 100 percent sure but he spent so much time travailing for the body of christ in the night watches that um when he went back to his homeland um away from india went back to his homeland they found that his heart had been enlarged and actually shifted in position because of the way that he had travailed. You know, it, we're hungry. All of us are hungry for a move of God. I am, I, you know, we're hungry for the raw power of an amazing God who does miracles, signs, and wonders. We want to see the greatness of God, his majesty, his glory. We want to see our nation shake under the power of the spirit of God. We want to, to um, see Australia conform to the prophecies that have been spoken over it. We want to see revival. We want to see an awakening, whatever it is you want to call it. We just want the fire of revival to come into our lives and into our nation. We want to see change. We want to see hospitals emptied. We want to see prisons closed. We want to see communities transformed we want to see the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven we've seen the transformational videos we've seen the things that God has done and all we can cry out is God as you've done it before you can do it again God if you did it back then you can do it now and God we are tired of a, of a powerless Christianity we are tired of words that are constantly being spoken out without signs and wonders and miracles following we are tired father of not seeing anyone being healed by our shadow as we walk past the sick and the injured and the addicted we are fed up god with a religion that gives us nothing but takes away from us and takes dignity and and, and everything precious away from our hearts and we are crying out under the power of the holy spirit for the true relationship with with the father god a true relationship with jesus christ where everything of educated christianity has whipped away from us and we are we are back in the raw 
raw walk with God. You know, the disciples did not have a Bible. They just had words. They just talked about Jesus. They lived with Jesus. They knew the Holy Spirit. They knew the voice of the Holy Spirit. We have so much information. We have so many podcasts. We have so many seeds. Um, Christian TV, so many books. I've got so many books, but we are not seeing the reality of God in our lives or in our nation or in our families or in our towns. We are not seeing anything really much happen. We get splashes of it. Occasionally there'll be a miracle. Occasionally something will happen, but it is not regular. It is not a lifestyle. It is not ongoing. It's a splash. And I am not prepared to put up with that anymore i don't care what it costs i don't care how much i have to invest jesus has done it all and i want to i just want to receive everything he's got for me so that he can pour out everything he's got for our nation for our children for our children and it's just it's not enough it's not enough to go to church. It's not enough to sit at home and read our Bibles and pray and have worship. It's not enough when the people around us are dying and going to hell. It's not enough when people are sick. It's not enough when people are in tragic marriage circumstances. It's not enough when we're not seeing healing manifest in the church. It's not good enough when we know the promises of God and we know the power of God and we are hungry for what he's got. It's not enough. We can't see settle we can't settle for this we cannot settle for where we are we cannot settle and it, whatever we've got to learn to pray differently whatever it takes but let the holy spirit lead us and guide us so that the fullness and the power of what god wants to do in us and through us and for our nation will happen it's time to just lay down everything and just say god whatever it takes to be a living sacrifice I'm it. I want what you want. I do not want what I want anymore. I want what you want. I just want what you want, Father. I know what you want for this nation. And I know what you want for the people around us. And I know that your love is so huge that you want to hold the people of Australia in your heart and in your hands. Healings, hospitals cleaned out. I'm tired of reading about it from 300, 400 years ago. I want to see it now. I want to see it now. And we have, it's almost like, I don't know what it is. I don't know whether we're so complacent, whether we've given up, whether we're just tired. I don't know what it is. But I know that God wants to do something amazing in our nation. And he wants to do something amazing in your lives. And all of us, all of us have this feeling on the inside that surely... There's more to God than this. Surely there's more to walking with Christ than this. Surely there is. And so, Father, I can't even articulate, but I want what you want. So you tell us what to do and we'll do it. I'm happy to lay down anything. I say that I'm happy to do it, Lord, but I'll probably kick and scream. No, I just... God, I can't, I can't stand the thought of people going to hell. I can't stand the thought of kids on the streets and being sex trafficked, domestic violence, human trafficking in our nation, mental health, because of COVID and we have the answer. We carry divine solutions through Jesus. And yet we seem to be stuck in just the same way as the world. Surely this is our time to arise. Surely this is our time to arise. And instead of, it's our time to arise. And I'm not, when I say that, I don't even really know to what, except 
to Christ and to the Holy Spirit, not to organized religion, not to comfortable church services, but just a lay down and God, the early church turned their world upside down. That's what they were known as. They turned their world upside down. Surely God, you can do that with us. Surely God, you can use us to turn the world the right way up. So Father, You can do, you can make a donkey talk. You can make an axe head float. You can do anything. So I ask you to do something with us. I ask you to use us. For the sake of, for the sake of the people. For the sake of the next generation. For the sake of the generation after that. God, I have no idea what following you in this looks like. I haven't got a compass. I haven't got a map. But I just want what you've got. I just want what you've got. I think I'm done. I'm going to go and cry <laughs> and pray. <laughs> I'm just so dissatisfied, so divinely discontented. God has done the work in me. I mean, it's a divine discontent. I just, I just don't want to settle. I'm not, I don't want this. And I know that in saying that, there's always going to be times when you want to go back to what's comfortable. But there's no life in comfort. It's just stagnation. And so, Father, we're all at different levels and we're all in different places. But I think each and every one of us has got a, a desire in our heart that we just want more of you. And we want more. We just want more of you. And whatever that looks like for us as individuals and whatever that looks like for us corporately. We just want more. We just want more of you. And we want to live lives of loving obedience. That if you call us out of the boat, we'll go out and walk on the water. If you call us to give the last cent we have, we'd do it willingly and joyfully. Just what a honor you and live for you in a way that brings you glory in a way that brings you glory and brings good to people we just want to bring good to people lord so father your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in our lives, in our families, in our nation. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would break every restriction, limitation, anything that holds us where we are. Holy Spirit, we give you permission to break it, free us. And teach us to soar with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it didn't go the way I thought. 